RoboCop. Who is he? What is he? Where does he come from? He is OCP's newest soldier in their revolutionary crime management program. OCP spokesmen claim that the fearless machine has crooks on the run in old Detroit. Today, kids at Lee Iacocca Elementary School got to meet in person what their parents only read about in comic books. Robo, excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Ow. Stay out of trouble. More fighting in the Mexican crisis today when American troops participated in a joint raid with Mexican nationals against rebel rocket positions in Acapulco. Now this. It's me. You, you, you hear what I'm telling you? In my mind, I created it. The culture, I created it, and it's real. Don't you understand? As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jack Allison. Today's special guest, the twisted minds behind the hit comic Justice Warriors. Matt Boers and Ben Clarkson join us to discuss this brilliant satire as well as the books and movies that inspired it. Matt, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us about Justice Warriors. Uh, Justice Warriors is a uh, s political satire, police procedural, dystopian comedy set in a far future world called Bubble City, where there is a massive domed megacity that has eliminated all crime and inequality. The only problem is the vast mega slum, which stretches <laughs> to the horizon, which has uh, formed around Bubble City. Now, you said this was a dystopia, but it sounds like it's pretty sweet for the people in the bubble. You're correct. It is actually quite utopian if you have the right zip code. Outside the bubble, it's pretty criminal out there. And so the book follows two officers of the Bubble City Police Department, the BCPD, as they brutally and methodically police uh, the slum, which is called the Uninhabited Zone. I noticed you said brutally, but not efficiently. Uh, they're not... <laughs> <laughs> so Justice Warrior is absolutely amazing comic. No kidding. This is one of the best comics I've read because at every step of the way, it's so funny because you don't pull any punches. You took the uh, comment subtext is for cowards quite literally <laughs> on uh, this one. Like you really go when you sit down to write a book. Usually the point is to try and be restrained, to stay within the lines, to not scare people <laughs> off. On the cover, I mentioned this on the episode last week, it's, there's a quote from Peter Chung who made uh, Eon Flux, Rain, pretty freaky stuff. He said that he was freaked out by your book. So <laughs> tell me about the twisted minds that came up with Justice Warriors. How, why did you go this type of comic? It, it's so bonkers, so fascinating. I absolutely love it. Uh, yeah, subtext is for cowards. Uh, <laughs> just just say what you mean. And then the thing I find really interesting about that phrase in relationship to Justice Warriors is there's still subtext to Justice Warriors. It's just the we're saying the quiet part of most satires loud so we can leave room for other quiet parts. Like there's a there's a lot going on in the comic where but on the surface, it's still it seems like poop jokes and a satire <laughs> of bad boys movies and uh, it's it's very loud. Credit goes to Ben for um, for most of the the world. He he created it before we got together and started writing it. Um, you know, he was conceiving it as an animation, and he reached out to me to write for it. And animation being harder to self produce, we decided to pitch it as a comic book. It was the type of world, the type of genre stuff that I've always been drawn to in comics. Just 
over the top violence, uh, heavily influenced by, you know, 80s and 90s action movies, sci fi dystopia stuff. Like, that's that's the stuff what I love. And if you've ever read my political cartoons, I try to incorporate that stuff into those a lot. But I was I was getting out of political cartoons at the time that Ben wrote me about Justice Warriors. And I was like, I was like, this is absolutely the comic I want to help make. Is there more to come? Uh, are we going to be seeing more Justice Warriors? Because uh, that that would be nice. Yes, there's there's no official uh, announcement yet, but we've pitched Justice Warriors Volume Two. Um, our publisher Ahoy is very you know in, into what we're doing. Um, all signs point to there being another volume. Uh, you know, I don't know when it would come out, but Ben and I are already writing it uh, with the anticipation that it will exist. Uh, shortly. And, you know, it's sort of like Ben Ben described ju- the world of Justice Warriors and what we want to do to me as like seasons of The Wire. And at, and at first it's that's, you know, because in The Wire they go to the docks and they go to the one involves, you know, newspaper publishers and stuff and a lot of the characters carry through. And at first I thought that didn't make a lot of sense because just tonally, you know, Justice Warriors is very different. <laughs> but it is what we want to do in the sense that we want to show every aspect of the society. Uh, so, like, we want to, we want to do a volume on elections, how elections work in this crazy world. We want to do a volume on like sports and you know basically the Olympics of this world and and so on and so forth. So we we really legitimately have like seven eight volumes of concrete ideas that we have. Uh, we have discussed this is in you know intended to be a long running comic series yeah cuz i was going to say even in this first volume uh, you know uh, i think you guys really hit a very difficult target to hit which is you know doing political satire that still does feel like a story unto itself and i think part of what makes that really work is you know the sort of shifting focus to different elements in this world it just moves so fast um and we're you know switching antagonists and switching different ideas uh, um so constantly uh, i think it really works and it's really fun and and you know on top of all that you know even though these characters are brutal you know horrendous police officers i think that there is actually something that does work between the characters and sort of despite them being horrendous uh there is something kind of lovable about them and i did find myself sort of caring about their partnership you know even in spite of uh, um the 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 satire that's, of it all uh, that's a huge compliment that that works uh yeah they're somehow lovable <laughs> uh lovable riot cops uh <laughs> One of them is literally, uh, for the viewer, uh, listeners who haven't seen it, one is literally a uh, human, like an anthropomorphic poop. Yes, a big the pile of one, shit. Just literal a, pile of shit. Like a literal pile <laughs> of shit And a police cop. officer. Uh, and it's his first day. Um, and then there is a big sort of uh, creature from the Black Lagoon sort of cop. And they're partnered together. Uh, yeah, people love them. I'm always amazed at how much people like shit. Uh, <laughs> people have done a lot of fan art of shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it, this is his name, Officer Shit. Yes, yeah. Officer <laughs> Shit. Yeah. To be to be clear, this is his wife's maiden name. He took her name. <laughs> yes, a feminist. Um, well, the book is really great, and I, I I do look forward to more. I had a blast reading it, and uh, yeah, I I think it works. You know, not only as a sort of you know throwback to fun '80s action, but also as just like a hilarious satire that feels uh, quite modern. I mean, it's about social media, it's about influencers, it's about astrology. You know, I, I think it. it you know, I'm I'm excited to see where you guys go next because even in this sort of first chapter in the bubble you know i felt like the world was so expansive and felt so funny and real yeah thanks i mean honestly i i i want to get to a a big fat omnibus someday with this you know like we want to do 10 volumes we want to trying to you know have the model is like what's a good creator on comic to you know hellboy or whatever where there's like you know 50 volumes and you just keep making them i mean honestly we 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 come up with yeah, we come up with ideas every other week. We're texting each other just a whole, you know, another, what if we did this? Uh, comic publishing isn't what it used to be where, you know, you could kind of launch an ongoing series. So it's the model now is you sort of do mini series and then you just kind of 
launch one a year or whatever. So I think that's the plan. As long as as long as people buy enough of them that we can keep doing them, we're we're gonna do one a year for like the next decade. That's awesome. Yeah. Once the writer strike is over, who is do you want directing the Justice Warriors movie? Michael Bay. <laughs> I think that's a great fit, honestly. No, I, I try to think about what would Michael I have a what would Michael Bay do bracelet <laughs> on at all times. Uh no, Michael Bay's an incredible artist and uh I think about his work all the time while I'm making Justice Warriors. I honestly don't disagree. I mean, I think that the writing sometimes isn't there, but watching a Michael Bay movie, you're like, this man is on an IMAX camera, on a you know electrified skateboard shooting an ex- an exploding car rolling into his face, like just on a process level, we have to we have to love him. Yeah, it, Justice Warriors is going to have to be. I, I don't know what degree it would involve, um, you know, CGI versus uh, practical effects, mm-hmm. but we even have like the idea of the uninhabited zone is the craziest place that we could dream up. It's not just inhabited by mutants. It, there are cartoon character species <laughs> yeah. like like Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So there's like tunes. So I imagine if we did a movie, I mean, there would be CGI people. There would be people walking on screen who are rotoscoped, who are cell animation. Like it, we would need... We would need a visionary like Michael Bay to execute this. And that brings us to the today's topic. There's crimes of the future, and you can't have crime without cops. Mm-hmm. Cops of the future. That is the topic of our episode today, of course, because of Justice Wars. But it's funny you mention Michael Bay, because I'm looking at his filmography. He has actually not done a science fiction cop movie. It's time. He's, it's, he's of course, he done cop to. movies. He's done science fiction action movies, but he's never brought the two together. Mr. Bay, call us <laughs> when the strike is over. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I was, I was interested in this episode, it, was, it wasn't just because I was reading Justice Warriors. It was also because I went back and I watched uh, Dirty Harry mm-hmm. uh, for the first time since I was a kid, right? And, when, and, you know, that's like the progenitor of all like modern cop movies where they're hunting down serial killers and they have to kind of paint or walk outside the lines, you know, to get the man because crime is running rampant in the city, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you go back and watch the movie now, it's quite funny, actually. It actually has a little bit more in common with like. Batman, like the Adam West Batman, like the villain is literally like the Joker. Uh, he has like a Rob and all this kind of goofy stuff in the follow up movies, like something like um, Death Wish, where it's mm-hmm. like a lot more like even though uh, Dirty Harry is pretty, you know, right wing and reactionary, like it got it was it was still has a sense of humor and absurdity about it. And the director of the film, like says, like, yes, J- Dirty Harry is supposed to be a vile racist. You're not supposed to root for him. And so I was thinking about how the how, how we see cops in movies. And generally speaking, in almost everything we see, cops are always presented positively. And we talk about propaganda a lot on the show. But the one exception when I was wrapping my head around this was science fiction mm-hmm. and anything said in the future. It was actually difficult for me to think of any movies or films or even books that present in, uh, that were science fiction that presented cops in a positive light. And I just wanted to explore that, talk about that, and talk about some of our, le- our favorite lovable, horrible <laughs> cops of the future. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, think it's like, you know, Ursula Le Guin has a quote about how science fiction isn't really, like, predictive. It's just, like, always about now. And I think that that's actually, mm-hmm. you know, obviously... Uh, uh, at play in Justice Warriors. But yeah, I think sci-fi gives license to creators to show cops as they are today um, in a way that doesn't make normal people uncomfortable. Movies like Death Wish and Dirty Harry are sort of about, they're about the here and now and about like a fantasy of like, you know, you wish someone would clean up the streets and this is how this is how it has to be done. It's like, you know, projecting yourself into this character that you're... Uh, you're kind of uh, getting a thrill that they get to uh, bend the law and uh, you know blow punks face off, faces <laughs> off. Whereas uh, sci-fi stuff, even you know, one one of the I think is interesting is Blade Runner because of um, mm-hmm. I mean, there's been so much discussion about Blade Runner, but you're you're basically watching a cop, um, you know, hunt down runaway slaves, really. Yeah, um, immigrants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and. <laughs> 
I, I mean, I've seen people be like, you know, what this is a movie about a about a, a cop that's trying to kill like clones and why is he the protagonist of the movie and everything. But it's like, well, if you watch it and you're actually paying attention, I mean, Harrison Ford isn't isn't portrayed as like a villain, like a Death Wish type stuff, but it is about that. He's basically mm-hmm. it's about his realization of what he's doing over the course of the movie. Yeah, I mean, Harrison Ford is not necessarily portrayed as a villain, but his bosses certainly are. Like, yeah. every scene with any other police officer, he's, like, constantly being monitored. When he goes in to see his, you know, chief, it's extremely ominous. Like, I think Blade Runner is a great example, you know, of kind of just beneath the the surface of it. I mean, in fact, like, you know, that is really, I feel like what the movie is about is, yeah, like, it, they the police as the slave catching patrol, you know, which is really what the, uh, uh, what American police force like descended from. But yeah, I mean, Blade Runner. And, and in fact, in some ways, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think the Blade Runner sequel, you know, doesn't work quite as well is it's, it's a little more unambiguous, you know, in, in, uh, the replicants sort of being, I don't know, made to be bad. Um, I haven't seen it in a little while, but I feel like the first one has a lot more sort of pleasing, um, you know, texture to the to the replicants and to the you know the the how conflicted Harrison Ford is. Uh, even Rucker Hauer at the end, Roy Beatty uh, shows the only kindness, the mm-hmm. only humanity in the entire movie when he spares Deckard. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's so it's a funny movie in the sense that like everyone is so concerned with reproducing society, reproducing this horrible world that uh, they aren't kind to one another. And the only one that can be kind is this hunted man. Mm-hmm. The The sequel, uh, I feel like I, I have some affection for Villeneuve because mm-hmm. he's from Montreal and I live in Montreal. That's basically where my... Oh, I love Montreal. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful city. It's beautiful. I'm a big fan of the place where I live, which is convenient. Uh, <laughs> Villeneuve, I feel... this. There's a subtext to the 2049, which is a lot about uh, women, I find. Like, the film mm-hmm. is really about the relationship between men and women and birth and reproduction, which... Um, Saying it now, I so I watched almost every movie on this. Uh, Leslie put together a list for this uh, for this podcast. Event Extensive that we're too, so pretty impressive, uh, honestly, that, that you got through the list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check the show list. notes. We should put yeah, put the list in the show notes. It's a great watch list. I watched a lot of it this week. Um, none of the TV because I do not watch TV. Uh, only yeah, good movies. For you. It, 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 life is too short to yes. let someone drag something out. Like, We've got a I'll cinephile a here. We've got a cinephile here, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm a movie man. <laughs> movie mindset. Uh, and something I noticed about the films is that uh, cop media, police procedurals, are about, this is what I noticed, um, social reproduction. They're, they're edipal. They're, there's this question of... Um, will you reproduce society? This is the question that's mm-hmm. posed to the cops. Like, are you going to reinforce these laws? Or are you going to take your role within this world? And some of them say yes. And then there's the very rare anti edipal film where they say no and society sort of collapses because the cop doesn't take their place. And uh, as we talk about the films, I'll I'll toss more of this opinion in because it's maybe a bit heady, but that's I very interesting. Everything. Like once again, twenty forty nine is a uh, that's my good introduction. It just sort of clicked to me thinking about it here. It's about social reproduction. It's about women having a role in social reproduction, and then how their bodies are policed and how pregnancy is policed. But I feel like it once again, like subtext is for cowards. Like it's <laughs> literally always in the background of every shot. Uh, I feel like it doesn't really succeed in the same way uh, as its progenitor because it's not as blatant mm-hmm. about with what it's about. I, I really liked the sequel, but I don't know. You know, the the first one is just is a very simple story, and you don't like you don't know about the world yet, and you find it out about it as you go along. So. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just cleaner. Like you're basically just watching, I, I view it as you're watching Harrison Ford's journey of, uh, you know, realizing that he's a, 
a, a killer for the for the state or for a corporation maybe you know i rewatched it i think last year for the first time in a long ass time and it, it hit like a lot of it hit me where so there's like one scene where he's killing shooting the woman who's running away and there's, she's like going through like shattered glass and it's like this elegant slow motion scene as she's like getting holes blown in her and i just thought oh that's just about like he's watching this and and starting to realize what he's actually doing and then by the end after roy batty dies and gives his like a famous speech he just he sort of sits there and stares at him for like an inordinate amount of time and i think he's just realizing like oh this was actually a human being that i was about to kill and then he saved my ass and said actually i think roy batty's best line is is not the speech but what he says right before it when he has Harrison Ford hanging off the edge of a building, and he says, it's quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? Mm. That's what it is to be a slave. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting talking about the movie Blade Runner versus the book that's based on Do Androids Dream of Electronic Sheep, written by Philip K. Dick, who wrote a lot of stuff that involved cops in the original uh, novel. It's the... Uh, somewhat unambiguous by the end whether or not the clones the um replicants have um emotions have the capacity for empathy the book kind of says makes it very clear that the answer is no that they ultimately aren't quite human but there is also the point that uh dick make uh makes in the novel that neither are the cops the cops who hunt mm. them down are also devoid of yeah. empathy and that's the thing uh that's the kind of struggle that decker g- goes through in the realization that he has he meets one cop that he suspects is a replicant he gives him the test he passed the test but he sees quite clearly that this man has no real empathy because he's been sexually exploited exploiting replicants that he's been you know subtasked with hunting down yeah that's another big theme that always comes back in cop media too uh i've watched so much uh that the cops are just another criminal gang Mm -hmm. and that's always like a subtext uh within not always a subtext but there is there are many films where that's part of the major subtext of the work so one where the cops as gangs thing is very prominent, the original Mad Max, where mm-hmm. you have this, uh, you know, a society that has already fallen. Just everyone is kind of pretending that it's still go, going along. Like the apocalypse has happened, but no one really is like uh, acknowledging it. They're still like going to work, going about their jobs. Doesn't sound familiar at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not at all. No, yeah. <laughs> And so you have Mad Max, who's in the first movie, I feel like people don't realize this. He is literally just a cop. He's just like a patrol officer, but he's called Mad Max because he, like Dirty Harry, uh, tends to, you know, go. He, he, he'll, he'll take it to the str- extreme. He'll do anything to bring those perps in. But by the end of the movie, I mean, actually probably fairly early on in the movie because all his, like, uh, co-workers are kind of douchebags, you realize that, oh, they're just another gang. And these are just two gangs fighting as opposed to, because the cops aren't really protecting anything. There's no more society left to preserve or protect. They're just out there hunt they're just doing the same thing the gangs are doing fighting for turf yeah and mad max turns into a, like a full-on he he turns into his alter ego toe cutter uh <laughs> at the end of the film when they sever his last little tie to the oedipal reproduction of society which is his wife and his child uh mad max also contains one of the funniest cuts of any movie i've ever seen where uh the camera pushes in on Mel Gibson sitting pensively and we hear saxophone music and then it cuts mm-hmm. to a reverse cut of his uh, girlfriend playing the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call diegetic. That's a diegetic sound. I feel like uh, the first Mad Max one is probably the one I'm the least familiar with or have watched the least amount of times. I don't I probably haven't watched it since the I 90s think that's common actually. I think people typically, yeah. you know, jump straight to the Road Warrior. Well, oh no, Road Warrior is the first one. Mad Max is the second one. Sorry about that. No, Mad Max is the first one. Okay, I'm sorry. Get it right, Jack. (laughs) Um, So I I, I love like, you know, the more obviously Fury Road is great. And and I love doing like Wasteland stuff. I've done it in a lot of my uh, editorial cartoons. The thing I think is interesting about um, Mad Max is I don't think him being a cop was really 
that had that much to do with George Miller's vision because the Mad Max movies are not, they don't actually make sense as a chronological story. It's mm-hmm. like he reinvents the story each time and it's, it all works, but it's not like, it It just doesn't make sense as a, as a, as a story. And he drops the cop thing. Um, you know, it's sort of ne- never mentioned again to my recollection. George Miller is uh, a sort of a filmmaker's filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Like he, he's, very good at shooting action and understanding the language. Like his films are about the language of cinema and the original Mad Max is really good from a low budget or a mid budget filmmaking perspective, but there's like, there's very little story to it. It's he goes on vacation and a motorcycle gang smells his wife (laughs) and then hunts him for the rest of the movie. Well, I wonder if it wasn't, um, I'm sure there's information about this, but if it was, you know, the cop angle was a product of that time where you have stuff like Dirty Harry coming out and they're like, well, like Dirty Harry, but it's the wasteland. Yeah, I, I see a lot of that in it. Uh, Dirty Harry's a, a progenitor, like direct progenitor for a lot of this stuff because Judge Dredd yeah. was mm-hmm. based on Dirty Harry and then RoboCop was an off like a, a a a brand ripoff of Judge Dredd, very exclusive, like explicitly, like they couldn't get the rights to Judge Dredd, so they made a RoboCop. And now we're carrying on the torch with uh, <laughs> Justice Warriors. So, yeah. so, so if Dirty Harry didn't exist, I, we wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> yeah, it's the trunk of the tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so that is something we had on our list: Judge Dredd, the comic, the movies, the, the adaptations. I've talked a couple of times about uh, Judge Dredd on the show. I really like the Sylvester Stallone movie to this day. It's not a good movie, but it has like really like cool effects and the costumes. I think they're by Gautier, you know, like it's a really interesting movie to look at, especially uh, for the budget and it's time. But this is a, there's a problem with the Judge Dredd movie as well as the follow up, the Carl Urban one uh, just called Dredd, which people love as, you know, an action movie. But as far as the um, the themes and the cop thing and the films both leave out entirely the point of Judge Dredd, which is that it's supposed to be a satire Mm -hmm. of, you know, of Thatcherism, of, you know, Reaganomics, of, you know, the 80s white uh, right wing, uh, um, you know, economic policy, because if you actually read the original comics of Judge Dredd, This the thing is that the megacy, this horrible place, how the earth is cur- the cursed earth, all this stuff, this wasteland that people li- live in, they ultimately choose to live there. There is numerous other planets that humans can travel to that are more or less paradise, but the people who are still on earth are there because they like it that way. They don't want things to change, so they stay on earth and they want the judges to lay down the law and live in this kind of dystopian society. And even past that, when you look at the really early comics, uh, the mega city isn't all, you know, like an urban wasteland. It's like a sort of like a 60s you know type futurism it looks like the Jetsons and so when you see Judge Dredd driving around on his motorcycle saying I am the law and you see all these people in like space suits and really nice you know um, modular you know globular houses it looks kind of ridiculous you see like the absurdity Mm -hmm. of it he's kind of this man you know holding on to these old ideas and raging against you know the new world that actually exists Yeah, in that sense, I think the Stallone Dread is a better uh, Dread than the Carl Urban one. Although I think the Carl Urban one is infinitely more entertaining to watch. Uh, Just because of the art direction. uh, Like, it is, it's impressive. The original Dread looks impressive, and the second Dread uh, looks like a high-budget college film at times. The problem with the newer one, I mean, I liked it, but it didn't capture the weirdness of, mm-hmm. like, you know, 2000 yeah. AD and, and the world of Dread, which is there can be mutants, there's aliens, but there, there's also just weird, you know, weird futuristic uh, societal trends. People are go, they call it going futsy, like going fu- uh, future shock causes people to go in and have mental breakdowns and become criminals all the time. And, you know, it, like the dread setup 
for the movie, the 2012 movie, I think it was, was, or whenever it was, um, you know, it's pretty traditional. It's just like, well, there's a, there's a, there's a gangster who runs this block and we mm-hmm. got to get her. And now we're, yeah, it is just kind of like a cop movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it misses a yeah. lot. I mean, dread the comics are like actually pretty funny, you know, like, I, and I think yeah. that there's a lot, you know, just explicitly that, you know, is satire and it is funny in it. And both dread movies, while I do actually kind of like both of them kind of really only get to this is cool, <laughs> kind of only get to like action is yes. cool, um, yeah. you know, versus the comics. I, I've read uh, an inordinate amount of dread comics over the years and I love them. And yeah, it's like the stuff that was, you know, 70s through the 80s is very satirical and over the top and great. And then, you know, in the 90s, I think it gets into kind of being sort of more of an action comic and grim and gritty like everything else was during that time Mm -hmm. but john wagner one of the co-creator and main writer throughout the years i mean he still writes it and i think dread today is you know as good as it's always been like that he's at he he has a little bit more serious tone and like examines fascism a little bit more seriously Mm -hmm. in the uh in some of the storylines that come out today so yeah i'd love if they got an adaptation right but you know i'm actually they already had two shots. It's time for Michael Bay to do Justice Warriors. <laughs> it might be worth looking at sort of the prototypical future cop, RoboCop. Uh, we talked about him sort of having his origins in... In fact, actually, RoboCop might be the uh, Judge Dredd adaptation, you know, that actually does really yeah. get the satire right. Yes, yes, absolutely. So RoboCop... Um, I was first introduced to RoboCop as a child because back then, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, our favorite characters were uh, like Freddy Krueger, Jason, RoboCop, the Predator, and Everyone Teenage you can Mutant play in Mortal Turtles. Kombat now. Yeah. Yes, yes. All the <laughs> R-rated stuff uh, was the big deal. And we were, as kids, we thought RoboCop was the coolest fucking thing in the world. Just because he looked, the suit, which they spent like sick. a year making. And and as you said, they did try to kind of rip off uh, Judge Dredd. That's where they started from. But they really spent a lot of time making this suit that actually like they had to have some Peter Weller, poor guy, actually had to wear. He had to learn and try. Train. He had to do like special like Tai Chi type training to learn how to walk inside it. And then when he put it on, it didn't work because it was too heavy. So he had to learn how to walk in a completely different way. But man, that movie, Paul Verhoeven, absolutely phenomenal film. I get more out of it every time I see it. Even as a kid, I just saw shoot, shoot, bang, bang, cool violence. But now you see the satire. And again, it's more of a economic, it's a, it's a satire of Reaganomics. It's basically showing how anything that capitalism touches, it will ruin in Including, like, say, taking over a uh, city's uh, security, it will just make things worse. In fact, it will make things worse on purpose to make more money uh, because its job is its point isn't to make things better, it's to make money. Um, I love Robocop so much, I watch it uh, all the time. So the new ones, uh, not so hmm. great again, they kind of yeah. d- digress into like action, just the cop stuff. But man, the original Robocop, love it. Yeah, it's, uh, I would also accept Verhoeven to direct a Justice Warriors movie. <laughs> yeah, sure. They, you know, RoboCop, I think, is a a north star for mm-hmm. for Justice Warriors. You know, as far as a, a cop satire, very influential on both me and Ben. I haven't watched it though in a long time. I could actually use a rewatch, but it was it re- really seared into my brain as a kid because, I mean, I was born in '83 and my dad had me watching you know, every rated R movie basically in real time. So I, I, I might've <laughs> saw this thing when I was like eight or something, you know? Um, and I don't know when I sort of picked up on the, uh, the politics of it, but I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear if you watch it, that it's doing something different than, you know, dirty Harry <laughs> and not just the, the futuristic stuff. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, I, I think a lot of it is Verhoeven too, obviously. Mm-hmm. Cause if you watch the other, RoboCops, there, there's something missing. RoboCop 2, I have some affection for RoboCop 2, because uh, it's also funny, but it doesn't quite get the... That's the Frank the, Miller one, right? Yes. Uh, 
it doesn't quite get the same hit the same points as hard as uh, Verhoeven's RoboCop because Verhoeven is very smart and he understood what was going on underneath of it. And there's so many tiny details, uh, like the f- news report at the beginning mm. when they announced that the French, uh, that uh, some African nation had unveiled a French neutron bomb <laughs> as their new defense measure, uh, which I laugh, I laugh and I laugh. It, Robocop uh, is a uh, comedy. It's I a mean, comedy. Robocop, Robocop also, of any movie made in the past depicting the future, got it closest to what it feels like to live in the future i think honestly like i look at i I watch that movie and it feels very familiar here's an interesting uh some interesting robocop lore i think this the the writer was this guy edward newmeyer and he's hardly written anything his filmography is robocop starship troopers Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchid, which uh, I don't know if <laughs> you would call that bad. one. <laughs> and then, interestingly, he wrote the reboot to RoboCop that came out like hmm. in the 2010s, which um, I thought was somewhat entertaining, but just kind of like you, you can't top the original, so why mm-hmm. even bother to do that? Uh, but here's this guy who has only written, you know, these two brilliant Verhoeven satires and like almost nothing else except like a, a B movie sequel that I didn't even know existed. But uh, a, a detail um, that I wanted to bring up was he actually wrote the original sequel to RoboCop two, which was going to be called RoboCop to the corporate wars. Mm-hmm. And then there was a, uh, another WGA strike in 1988. Mm-hmm. And uh, for whatever reason, when things resumed, they they hired Frank Miller. You know the writers. I don't know exactly what happened, but the writer strike somehow caused him to lose the gig, and uh, the production company just hired Frank Miller. I don't know if he was scabbing or what, but uh, the, we got we got I a would different fit with RoboCop. his politics. I think. <laughs> yeah, we got a different RoboCop, and I th- I would. I don't know if that's out there on the internet or something, but I'd love to read this guy's strip or uh, screenplay because he, he seemed if if this guy wrote Starship Troopers in the original RoboCop, he uh, you know he. He seems to be the guy that the, the, he's the, he's the source. Yeah, I would say that RoboCop is a good example, uh, a rare example of an anti-edible uh, cop hmm. movie, where RoboCop chooses to overcome his sort of place in society and uh, go against Omnicorp. It, a lot of the time, these anti-Oedipal comp movies, like Mad Max, lead to the dissolution of society itself this one more optimistic uh society survives robocop but he still bucks his uh social programming so a unique cop film here's a quote from newmeyer on why he wrote the movie milton friedman and the chicago boys ransacked the world wow enabled by reagan and the central intelligence agency beautiful i mean that says it all that's that should be on the back of Justice Warriors. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah Ro- RoboCop really one of the all time greats, and yeah, again, I, you know, especially the clips from TV, I feel like you know really got their finger on the pulse of what it was going to look like to live uh, uh, in the future of 1987. I'm going to point out another anti edible cop movie, uh, one near and dear to my heart, Demolition Man. Where oh, at yes. the end of the film, uh, basically society is w- wiped away for everyone to start again. Sort of like a negative revolution where nobody has any idea what to do, but the current social order just fails to reproduce itself because of the actions of uh, the enigmatic John Spartan. Yeah, it's very interesting because, um, yeah, j- like John Spartan's whole deal of being a sort of... Uh... I mean, he's kind of a dirty Harry on steroids. You know, he's a guy who will break the law to enforce it. And then, but then the the, the 90s, it was what, 94? They sort of imagine what if, what if these Dirty Harry movies and like all the 80s action movies, like what if they can't exist in the future because it's too PC? Like what if action heroes can't just kill whoever they want? So they freeze them. And uh, yeah, by the end of the movie, though, he's not political. So they do. If you remember, there's for for listeners, you know, there's 
there's this the the PC world and everything seems fine, but then there's the underground uh, Dennis Leary types who want to smoke cigarettes and eat red meat, even though it's bad for you. And at the end of the movie, uh, Stallone is just kind of. I mean, I think he literally just says, "You're gonna have to work it out." <laughs> like, <laughs> like he doesn't really have politics. He doesn't have a solution. He 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 punched. He kicked actually Wesley Snipes' head off, and that's really the end of his story. That he was there. That's all he knows how to do. So he saved the day, and um, because there was that weird guy uh, who was like engineering society, he died, and then now they have to figure out a new society. <laughs> but it doesn't really engage with it. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you could read Demolition Man. You could read it in quite reactionary ways, like they have to unfreeze, you know, uh, a man, uh, a real man from the past because everyone in the future has become liberal sissies. Like you said, like, Sylvester Stallone just says the two groups, the people who are who are completely outcast from society and, you know, the liberal douchebags have to find a way to work it out. The liberal douchebags can't keep hoarding all the funds and the money and the resources. They have to actually let these people into society as, you know, free people who don't necessarily want to, you know, not swear and yeah. and follow, you know, this uh, kind of regime. And actually, uh, the living under the surveillance state is a big issue in it. They don't want to constantly be uh, surveilled all the time. That's that's not presented as a fun thing. The world isn't necessarily a utopia just because there isn't any quote unquote crime. Well, and let's let's you yeah, know address the uh, the main thing, which is that they they've outlawed sex. So this is a this is a bad society, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> this is this is not good. These the underground they want to fuck smoke. Uh, eat sugar, rat burgers, uh, drink beer. I mean, this is my kind of place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, D Demolition Man is really where I got the original idea for this Oedipal cop thing because there is so much tension between the society that John Sarton has been tasked with saving and his own personal desires. And it's very blatantly about that that Oedipal um, urge, that Oedipal pull. Uh, even uh, the villain, the big bad guy, uh, Jean Cocteau, or Cocteau, Dr. Cocteau, that's a reference to Jean Cocteau, who also wrote an adaptation of Oedipus Rex called The Infernal Machine. Like, mm. there's even literary references to these ideas within Demolition Man, which makes it really unique as well in that it's a highly literate action film. There's a lot of allusions through throughout. It's it's one of those movies, I mean, it's a lot of people have affection for it because it's kind of funny and goofy. I think there's a there's a better version of Demolition Man that could have been made with like a, a different filmmaker or a different script or something. They also edited out storylines. Like if you remember he uh there's like a c plot of him having a daughter and they don't show her in the beginning for one but uh so it's kind of weird all of a sudden there's talking about whether or not he has a daughter and then it you're like is sandra bullock his daughter and he's gonna have mind sex with her and then they never address it again but uh she's in the original movie um she's shown like crying as he gets going to, goes to jail and then she's one of the underground people which I think is actually interesting is that his his daughter is like trying to overthrow society. So, you know, that softens him up a bit, too, because he's a he's a dad reunited with his kid. But they don't they don't show it. And there's a bunch of other stuff. I mean, just, you know, dealing with the politics of it, I think a little better, like what the, the Cocteau guy was actually doing would have made it better. And then, and then Wesley Snipes just sort of kills him. And then it just becomes John Spartan versus Simon Phoenix for no real reason. And uh, so I. I I wish we got a little bit better version of Demolition Man, but it's obviously just a fun as hell movie. What if John Spartan and Simon Phoenix had teamed up at the end? Modern day Napoleons. <laughs> they would have uh, conquered the world in uh, mere months. Yes. <laughs> they both agree on a lot, right? Sec, they're probably one of the only, uh, they're only people outside of the underground who believe that sex should be uh, engaged in uh, frequently. <laughs> I love, I love John Spartan's character, by the way, he's, he comes back 
after being frozen for however many years. It's alluded to that he was conscious the whole time, like basically being tortured. And then he's like, oh, my wife's dead. And then like 10 minutes later, he's like about to have sex with Sandra Bullock and he's mad that they're not having physical sex. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much to say about it, but uh, I was impressed, really deeply impressed with Soylent Green, actually. I'd never seen mm -hmm. Soylent Green, and I did not know that Justice Warriors owed so much to Soylent mm -hmm. Green yes. until I had watched it. And it really hammered, like, this has, watching all these films has been a wonderful educational experience, and I'm incredibly thankful that I did it. And that uh, this was the idea for this uh, pod, because I now know so much, so many more reference points of this like very minute genre of like pessimistic future cop uh, movie thing that it opens up so many avenues for us to go even moving forward with Justice Warriors. And I mean, it's so funny. It's funny that you'd never seen it, you know, because uh, obviously there's food riots ostensibly in both Justice Warriors and Soylent Green. Yeah, I'm just going off of what I see happening in the next five to ten months. <laughs> it is actually pretty influential on me now that I think about it. I have a very distinct memory of being shown that movie in my ninth grade science class. Uh, I guess, you know, the guy wanted to have a day off or whatever. He, <laughs> he was just like, watch. <laughs> He's like, let's watch this cool movie. And I was like, oh, you know, the rich are in bubble cities, essentially, eating apples while everyone else is eating. Uh, and that, the only thing I don't know is if I knew the twist at the end or not at the time. But, you know, everybody else is eating people. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 it made an impression for sure. Yeah, it uh, it's also a really good example of why there is so much cop media. And what I mean by that is Charlton Heston is exploring this world and we go along mm -hmm. with him while he explores the world and he needs a reason to do it. And so there is a murder and then we go on an investigation and cop movies have investigations and crimes mm -hmm. in them. So we almost have a reason to explore a, a, a world of allegories for our own world as they explore these films and so the structure of the investigation is very clear uh, in Soylent Green, which is super interesting and uh, really beneficial for for my cognition of cop movies. Well, I think uh, today, you know, we're very hyper aware of of copaganda, mm -hmm. but I th I think one of the reasons that it's you know so ingrained in fiction is, like you said, it's 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 a good narrative device, but and also. Um, you know, it goes back to Westerns too. It's a, it's all about <clears throat> they're like, who are the people in society who are licensed to kill? Uh, like it makes for an interesting story. You, cause if you have, if Charlton Heston is just a guy who decides to look into this stuff and then he starts, you know, shooting people or something, it's like, oh, well the, the cops are going to come and arrest him. Like you can't, you can't do that. You can't be like a, a lawless protagonist in most movies, uh, without the, logic of the world collapsing but like cops are the people who can like uh you know move between the law essentially and do <laughs> illegal things or actually have a shootout with people on the street and not uh not be in jail the next day right i mean they, and they also sort of like have the ability to traverse worlds you know what i mean mm -hmm. like they're allowed into corporate businesses to interview the the executives and they're also on the street and with the food riots and everything like that like yeah i think it it is you know there's a reason noir is such a popular genre as it's sort of an outsider character like us as the viewer you know unfolding things before our eyes that was struggle session thank you so much for listening matt ben where can people find you uh, online you, yeah the internet uh it's a public service that's been highly privatized uh, <laughs> uh i'm on twitter at ben clarkson and on instagram at ben clarkson one million the number not the the word and very easy uh matt where, where can they find you i'm just matt Bores on you know most of the main uh platforms easy to find and at bookstores, you know, or wherever they still sell comics, uh, any anywhere that physical media is still available. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, you can find it at bookstores, which is quite surreal for me. Uh, <laughs> having a book, it's weird. It's cool. Uh, you can get bookstores, and there's also a Simon and Schuster link I will send to you guys, which is a really great way to buy it online. Have a good one. Peace. Later. Like what you hear? Want to hear more? Check us out at patreon.com slash struggle session or sesh.plus or struggle session.substack.com for all our public episodes, commercial free, as well as hundreds of bonus episodes. Thank you to all our listeners for holding us down five years strong.